Um, this presentation, um, I'm going to be talking about principles, uh, principles that you can utilize that are really going to help you to be successful with with uh, with Pulsar in your organization as well as um, with other technologies. Uh, these are general principles that I've derived from uh, from looking at you know what the differences were in companies that really were the most successful, and I've done quite a bit of research. Um, and um, some of this research came from books that I'll uh, recommend at the end of this presentation as well, where they uh, actually studied companies that were the most successful. Um, so I've, I've tried to distill a lot of that uh, into these principles that we'll be talking about. Um, so the first step um, when you're trying to introduce something new to your organization, especially an influential technology like Pulsar or something that's technologically superior, um, or even if it's just solving a critical business problem, you've got to think like an entrepreneur. You've got to put on your entrepreneur hat. And the reason is because a lot of times when you're trying to do this, um, your initiative or your effort, you, you basically form like a mini startup within your company. And this is especially the case when you're at a bigger company, but I think it still applies when you're at a smaller company. Um, and so if you're really successful, you get widespread adoption, then it will grow your team, you know, you'll get more resources, it'll grow. Um, and, uh, and then there, the flip side can also happen, which is like the equivalent of you going out of business, which would be like you getting fired, right? And then nobody wants that. Um, so in order to build the right solution, um, we're going to talk about, you know, what that process looks like and how you can make sure that what you build is actually going to get you where you want to go. Um, and so the first step is you've got to nail the problem. Like, you, and we're going to go through uh, a couple examples of this uh, with an analogy. Um, you, in order to build the right solution, you have to make sure you fully understand the problem. If you don't fully understand the problem, you're going to miss. You're not going to deliver exactly the right solution. and, and uh, and you're not going to get the kind of adoption that you want. Or worse, is you get adoption quickly, but then people are unhappy, they reject it, move to something else, uh, and then the rug sort of pulled out from under you. So neither of those would be ideal outcomes. Um, so in order to really uh, build the right solution uh, and nail the problem, you've got to find uh, the true underlying pain point. And you want to look for I, it, what I refer to as a shark bite problem. I'm not the one who coined that term, but um, you want to look for a major problem, not like a mosquito bite problem. Um, if the problem is just annoying, well, people aren't going to be motivated to risk moving to a new solution. Now, it might not seem like a risk to you, but uh, to people who aren't as familiar, um, you know, it's still going to look like a risk to them. Um, and of course, there are going to be risks in some in some way. Uh, either either way. So, um, but the point is that um, if if it's just an annoying problem, they're not going to be as motivated. And if you want to get widespread adoption, you want your you want people to be motivated um, until at least you've built enough momentum and successes that it becomes the clear, uh, obvious solution for people to use moving forward. Um, and then you can build additional successes and gain synergy um, that will allow you to get even widespread adoption. Now, if you build a platform that nobody uses, what you know that's going to that's going to do you no good. Even if you can successfully build the platform, uh, you you want to get that adoption, and to to get the adoption, you need to cure a major pain. Um, so that requires uh, this step stepwise discovery process. A uh, problem discovery uh, happens incrementally, um, and it requires significant research. You need to really you want to get a full understanding of the of the underlying pain and its root cause and all of its factors, anything that can influence it, um, find out who who's involved, who is knowledgeable about it, who's impacted. You want to really understand it. Um, otherwise, it's so easy to make assumptions that you might not even be aware. They might just be kind of automatic things. Oh, you think it's obvious, and so you don't even question it. And then it turns out that something wasn't quite right, even if you, you know, maybe you were sort of on the right track, but it still wasn't quite right. Um, that can cloud your success and cause you to miss your target. Um, small mistakes or errors in, in your judgment can really have a big impact uh, over time. And so you want to do a deep exploration of the problem to find the right solution. So um, the goal is to discover the true underlying pain point. 
Now, uh, what is a black swan? Okay, let's talk about this. So once upon a time, people didn't know that black swans existed. They thought that there was no such thing. They thought that all swans were white. And if you were to say, oh yeah, what about a black swan? People would think you're, you know, it was a joke, right? People th would think you're, uh, th it's not possible. Um, well, then one day an explorer discovered uh, that there was such a thing as a black swan. Whoops. Um, and, uh, and this discovery was quite startling to people. And so it became this idea that uh, if you can find a black swan, you're finding a hidden truth uh, that might run counter to expectations um, that can influence uh, a decision or the success of the implementation of a solution. So you want to find these hidden truths because if you can find them, you'll build a much more effective solution. Now the trick is learning how to find them. And part of the challenge is that people who who have this information, they might not even be aware of how important that information is. Um, so since the information about black swans is stored in people, not in systems, you can't just dig through code and expect to find a black swan. I mean, for those of us who are programmers, that would be fantastic, right? You could just look at it that way. Um, but you've got to be able to get information from people. Now, sometimes you can do like a survey, um, but still surveys are typically structured, which still have assumptions kind of baked into them um, that can lead to bias um, and cause you to not fully understand something. So, um, so the best way or one of, you know, one of the strategies if you're going to have multiple tools that you're going to uh, leverage um, is you've got to be able to build empathy through active listening. And so um, this is really simple, but it's super powerful. And it really starts as you repeating back what you've heard the speaker say, right? It sounds simple um, and it might sound so simple that you think, well, it's silly, but it really makes a big difference. Um, and one of the reasons is it helps the speaker to know that you understand what they're saying. Um, and that helps establish empathy and build trust. Then they feel understood and then they can go deeper into, uh, into what they're trying to say um, or what they're trying to get across. Um, so you could think of it like test-driven development, but for communication. Um, so it allows the speaker to know they can go deeper into the content and that can reveal critical information. And like I mentioned, the speaker might not even realize how important that information is. Um, they might, you know, just kind of mention something in passing and then, you know, for you, that's a huge deal to know that. Um, so if you're going to be a leader in creating a micro startup in your company uh, to build a solution, uh, you know, like a, like a platform based on Pulsar, um, you need to make sure you're you're making the time every day to develop those communication skills in your business savvy. Um, and like I said, for, you know, for those of us who are programmers, you know, that might not come naturally, but it's really worth the effort you put in. Um, and if nothing else, it'll, it'll absolutely pay off um, by saving you time uh, that would be otherwise spent on building things that, um, uh, that won't really get adopted or won't make a big difference. And so you don't want to waste your time by building the wrong things. You want to focus your time on what really matters the most. Um, and then um, an easy way to get this, uh, to get this skill um, is you can start by, um, well, I, I mentioned a list of books at the end of this presentation. And so you can get them in hard copy or audiobook. Find time to study them. Um, you can, you know, instead of listening to music, um, you know, when you're in the car or you're going for a jog, um, you can listen to these audiobooks. And then make sure you practice the skills every day. If you practice every day, um, even if you just spend 30 seconds a day, find a partner or somebody that you can that you can work with on these things, like active listening. Um, that will help it. That will help these skills to become more natural and automatic. Um, and then when you encounter situations where um, it re becomes really useful, it's just you know automatic. You just kind of go into the zone and can can help somebody. Uh, you know, in that communication aspect to, to provide the information that you need so that you can find the real underlying pain and solve the problem or, or find, you know, find what, uh, what you need to know. So let's go through an example of an information gathering process. Now, let's say you are a doctor and, um, uh, now, if any of you are, are doctors in this audience and uh, in, in a medical sense, which is probably unlikely, but um, hopefully this is not going to butcher that. But um, so just bear with me here. So let's say you've got a patient come in, uh, come into your office and uh, they, they, they have pain, right? So you could say, all right, well, you know, what's, you know, this is level one data, right? So what could you do? You could prescribe painkillers and see them again in three months, see how they're doing, right? Um, and 
you know, in a sense, you could say, well, it's sort of curing their pain, but it's not really a cure, right? It's more like a mask. Um, so uh, we, what we want to do is we at least want to get level two data. Um, so that might mean uh, an x-ray or some other imaging like CT scan. And then turns out there's an aggressive cancer. Okay, now this completely changes our understanding of the problem, right? Instead of, you know, it's, okay, they're just having pain, no big deal. It's okay, now, now there's a major issue that could be life-threatening um, and we need to, we need to approach this. We need to take, you know, the right approach to, to how we handle this. So, um, we don't put this person's life at risk. Um, so you can start with, uh, you know, uh, an approach based on this level two data. You're going to, let's say, take a stab at it, uh, literally <laughs> surgical removal, uh, reevaluate in three months, see how they're doing. Um, or we can get level three data, right? You can get a biopsy send it to the lab, find out if it's sensitive to any particular medications. Um, and then from there, um, let's say it turns out it's sensitive to platinum. So you prescribe a platinum-based drug like cisplatin, see how they're doing in three months, right? Same kind of strategy. Um, but maybe there's more we can, you know, we can get, we can get level four data. Um, and if it's a serious enough of a problem, then it's absolutely worth getting all the data you can, um, you know, of course, within reason. but. Um, you want to get all the data that you can that could help uh, identify the right solution. So you talk to surgery, you talk to radiology, you talk to oncology, and then it turns out that um, based on the consensus, you know, as you as you put the experts together, that the right approach is a combined a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. Um, and so you can see how with with each incremental step of this information gathering process, we're changing our course, right? We're um, we're, we're dialing down to a more precise uh, a solution that is going to get us closer to where we want to go. Um, now let's take a look at kind of another side to this. So patient comes in, they've got pain. Um, you could, again, you could prescribe painkillers, reevaluate in three months, um, or you go through some, you know, you're gonna get some level two data. Um, so you inspect the site of the pain Turns out they've got a thorn in their foot, right? Okay, well, is this really a big enough of a problem that you need to engineer, you know, a solution like like a Kevlar thorn-proof shoe? Right? Well, probably not, um, you know, unless it turned out that this was like this huge industry problem, right, where everybody has thorns in their feet, they don't even realize it, and it's causing them to get infections. But I think we know that's not the case, and, uh, you know, uh, there's probably something else going on there if if they're coming to see the doctor and they, they were, maybe it was a really deep thorn or something, I guess that happens. But it's probably not a life-threatening problem at this point uh, or something that would really be worth going uh, through a deeper analysis. Um, okay, so, um, so once you've nailed the problem, once you've found a problem that's worth solving and you've really nailed it, that's when you want to start rapidly iterating towards a solution. Um, now at this point, this stage, it's really important that you're working towards a solution, not the solution, because at this stage, you don't know what the solution is. You might think you know. Right? You might know certain things about it, like you know it's going to have Pulsar involved, um, but um, the the goal of rapid iteration is to identify what, what that solution looks like, um, and that means that you may need to quickly pivot as you're, as you're you know, you take a stab at it, you see how well it fits, you get feedback from others. Um, and, you know, being able to quickly pivot, uh, that requires hum humility. So it's important to be humble and recognize that you don't know everything at this stage and, uh, you know, and, and you need to be able to get the information from those that, that have a say in this, um, especially, particularly those whose pain you're attempting to cure. So you don't want your agile processes to operate in a vacuum. It can be super easy to do, right? You start iterating within your team, you get really excited, you're, you're having successes, you're knocking down user stories, and, um, and then uh, you build this thing and then you, know, you start getting feedback from your, your customer or whoever, you know, your, your, who, whoever your, uh, your pain, whoever it is that you're curing their pain. Um, and then it turns out that you know, they're like, well, this isn't gonna do me any good. Well, it can be easier to do than you'd expect. Um, so it's so important that you involve them um, early in the process and can include their feedback 
Um, and that may require educating them about different aspects of what you're trying to do. Um, but you don't want to operate in a vacuum because uh, when you're missing critical information that may be uncovered as you're iterating towards a solution, um, you can uh, you can be blind to oversights. Um, and at this stage, this early stage, it's a really big mistake because you can miss. And you know, if we all had infinite resources and infinite time, it, maybe it wouldn't be a big deal. But um, since we're all pretty limited in what we can do, uh, it's really important to stay laser focused. Um, and make sure that any other teams that you would need to have involved uh, can be involved um, so you can validate and refine your, your process quickly and what you're doing. So make sure that you're working on curing that underlying pain. So among the companies that were the most successful, um, the data has shown that these companies would fire bullets before firing cannonballs. So what does this mean? So bullet is a low cost, low risk, and low distraction either initiative or project, um, but the idea is it's low cost, low risk, and low distraction. Um, now for different companies with different resources, uh, different areas of expertise, uh, different sizes, you know, what might be a cannonball for one company might be a bullet for another. So it's important that you, you know, consider all the factors. Um, so like, you know, as an example, maybe, you know, rolling out a Pulsar function in a new app, that might be a bullet for one, whereas a cannonball might be like doing a bulk migration of a thousand Kafka apps to Pulsar, right? You know, but again, depending on the company and the resources, like maybe even just using a Pulsar function, new app could be a cannonball if you're like, you know, just barely getting started. Um, so you need to be thinking about what, what, you know, what would be a bullet in your situation? And the key thing is you fire bullets first. Um, and this is the reason is because, um, you know, if you miss, it's not a big deal. You can pivot, you can try again. Um, and that allows you to calibrate your aim so that when you're ready to fire the cannonball, you know it's going to hit your target um, because you don't want to take the risk of missing when you're firing, when you're putting all the resources into a cannonball. Um, now, a lot of company cultures, the data shows a lot of company cultures, they just fire cannonballs. Um, and those companies are not the ones that are the most successful. And sometimes they go bankrupt. Um, so you want to be able to establish empirical validation uh, on, on those bullets that you fire. And sometimes people get so impatient, they think something is promising, it seems excited, exciting as, you know, as, uh, as progress is made, and so they put a whole bunch of resources or people into something, well, that turns it into a cannonball. Um, and then you can burn up your runway. Um, and some co companies have a culture of, of doing this. So you gotta watch out for that. Um, because those uncalibrated cannonballs, they'll burn up your runway so fast that you won't have time to actually make sure that the solution you build will succeed. Um, and what you don't want is for people to then say, well, Pulsar was a failure, so we're not gonna do that again. Well, then you totally blew it, right? Uh, you don't wanna take that risk. Uh, you wanna make sure that you that when, when you take a stab at this, that you're gonna gain that success, um, you're gonna build the momentum, and then you're gonna be able to spread the adoption uh, as your, and then, which will allow you to cure additional pains that um, you know that all came from that initial solution. Um, and so you know you can burn up your runway from either curing the wrong pain or curing it in the wrong way. I guess that wouldn't really be a cure, right? So where you miss the mark. Um, so it's also a big mistake to build a car to test an experimental engine design when you haven't yet validated the engine. Um, a lot of people do this too, right? That, you know, you're trying to start with something simple and then this whole thing gets built and then it turns out that like that key root thing wasn't, wasn't done right. And then it might require a, an enormous amount of work to, to fix that. So um, if you can quickly build prototypes, start simple, like pulsar functions are a great way of starting simple. Um, don't spend all your time building things, uh, you know, that are like supportive until you validated that key thing. And so, um, with quick prototypes that allow these will allow you to, to validate something in a simple context um, and then you can expand from there and then if you have to throw away a prototype it's not a big deal right you can start with a new approach so let's walk through another analogy um, and we'll apply this to a stream messaging context so the first step uh, to firing a bullet is you've got to aim right I, I mean you know, unless you're, well, I don't, I don't want to suggest not aiming at your target, right? You've got to aim. So when you aim, you're lining up your aperture, uh, which, you know, is, 
it could be your, your scope or, or the site you're looking through, you're, you're lining that up with the source, which is, um, uh, that would be your aperture, sorry, your aperture is your source. So, um, and you're lining that up with your target, um, which would be like your sink, right? Think of like a Pulsar sink. Um, or it could be a uh, similar destination like an API or web service. So uh, that looks like this. So you start out with source data. In this case, we've got activity data uh, from like a, a, an educational technology app. Um, so learning activity data, students doing some kind of activity and data is produced. And then you've got a destination. So let's say in this app, um, we want to identify which students are at risk or which students are behind uh, their peers. So these are the students that might require some kind of personalized intervention, whether it's like a human intervention or, you know, just in the app. Um, either way, you want to be able to identify who's at risk. Um, so after you've identified, um, you know, what your source and your destination look like, then, then the goal, right, is to figure out, okay, well, how do you get from A to B? Um, and then it might turn out that uh, as you're going through the process of that analysis of determining how you're going to get there, you might realize, oh, we're missing some important data. And so then you might update your producer, right? So then let's say you realize that you need to, to segment it out by the different like activity modules. Um, so you can determine like, you know, some other, based on some other criteria, you're, you're making the right comparisons. Um, uh, or it might turn out that um, that is more appropriate to use stream enrichment to add the data within the flow. Um, so, um, and I've, I've got other talks that talk about different messaging patterns around that. Um, so from there, uh, the engineering task then is to determine, okay, what are the transformations that must happen to get from A to B? So uh, in this case, in order to determine that a student is at risk, um, we could say, well, we need a Z-score. We need to determine statistically whether or not be, they're behind their peers. Um, and let's say the students who are the most at risk are at least two standard deviations below, right? So that's really at risk. Um, and, um, and that requires us to compare uh, a student's performance to school averages. So we determine that, okay, the message uh, needs to have those, like the average, the average and standard deviation. And then, you know, from that, as long as we have that in the message, we can compute a z-score. Um, and so then we determine that um, we need uh, to be able to compute the z-score and those statistics from, uh, you know, the aggregate of uh, all the student data as it's coming through. So we need some kind of, like, you know, stateful compute or it could happen in a database or, or whatever. The idea here is we first start by looking at the data flow and what transformations are required and what that data is, what, what our data needs are before we identify the technology. Because, you know, the, one of the worst things you could do is identify a flow where Pulsar is, like, you know, uh, I don't know, you, you can apply Pulsar in a lot of situations, but if it could be the wrong technology and you decide to use it anyway, um, then you're not going to have a successful implementation and people are not going to be happy. So you don't want to do that. You want to make sure you use the right technology for the right thing. So by identifying this in the, in the data flow first, um, you're going to maximize your likelihood of success. Um, so in this case, then we identify, okay, you know, you, you've got to uh, consume from, uh, from these original messages and then have some kind of stateful compute. Um, and then you're going to have to perform some kind of enrichment um, as those messages come through. So at this point, we can determine that Pulsar functions uh, make a lot of sense for these for the simple transformations, um, you know, where you're doing a lookup or a simple computation, um, and then um, you can use um, you can use Pulsar topics to glue all these different parts of the flow together, and then you can identify that. You, you need some other technology as well, like, you know, for uh, like a stateful compute engine or, or some kind of data service that's going to allow you to, um, to perform some of the, the other aggregation based on historical data. So, so this approach um, I'm referring to as consensus-based data modeling, where you start by identifying the things that nobody can dispute, right? You know that, like in that particular flow, uh, everyone could agree that you've got to identify students at risk and everyone can agree what the source data looks like. Um, unless that needs to be modeled, in which case you've got some more flexibility, but you could at least say, these are the things that we can gather. Um, from there, then you can identify, okay, how do we get from A to B um, based on the data? And you can skip all the contention that can just co totally kill progress. Like people will say, no, you should use Kafka or Pulsar or back and forth or other technology, this and that. 
Um, you can just cut through all that by identify by modeling out the solution like this, and then the right technologies will become much more obvious very quickly. Um, and then you can start saying, okay, this is what we can do. We can plug this in here and this in there. Um, and then it, it allows you to use the right technology for the right purpose, which will maximize the likelihood of success. Um, this kind of approach also allows you to identify any glaring issues as they become more obvious. Um, let's see, okay, I'm running short on time here. So um, one thing you don't wanna do is boil the ocean on, on day one. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're not firing uncalibrated cannibals, right? So um, gaining success with your first sol solution will allow you to gain synergy and momentum. So it's important to, to keep that in perspective to ensure that um, your bullet nails the target. Um, you also wanna avoid premature optimization. Um, optimization is great, but you've gotta calibrate your delivery um, first. And so modeling your data uh, first is a great way to do that. Um, an example of what to not do. Uh, so Webvan uh, is a famous dot-com startup that pioneered home grocery delivery. And they thought through everything, right? So in terms of delivery process, logistics and fulfillment of optimization, um, they built the most advanced robotic-driven warehouse automation that had ever been built. And they had custom algorithms at every step and advanced tracking and inventory management, but they ran out of money. They lost $1.2 billion of capital. Um, and how did that happen? Well, they focused on the wrong things and they couldn't get enough business to make it sustain. So they missed the mark. Um, and in this case, it was largely by premature optimization. Now, you can also go too far down the other path on the flip side, which is where you hard code yourself in a way that kills your agility. Um, so by not thinking about scalability up front and, and during the process, you can suck all the time right out of your team. So it's important to think about self-service and generalizability and look for patterns that help you do that. So the way to do that is you automate after you calibrate. Um, as, as you build a solution, pains are, are gonna start appearing in your optimization uh, or in your, in your ability to deliver. Um, and so it'll become apparent um, what you need to do to make sure that you can scale better. Um, and so you want to focus on automating the right things and not get distracted. And that can look, um, oh, and so if you can anticipate a clear problem in your ability to scale, you want to find a way to, do, to incrementally automate to create a path um, or that will give you a roadmap of how you can deliver uh, immediately while still having a clear plan of action that will enable you to scale more as you move forward and get greater adoption. And that can look kind of like this. It, it looks silly, but I'm, I'm serious. This is, this is how you do it. You start when you're low in resources, you start by building the interfaces uh, and then you incrementally automate what's in the middle. So, you know, initially like in, in this, in this example, um, you know, if you've only got a couple of people coming through uh, sending you tickets that you have to check every day, then, you know, you don't really need to automate that yet. It doesn't take somebody very long, but once you've got a solid flow and you're really utilizing a person's time a lot, um, well, at that point, you, you're, you're running out of resources in your team, you need to make sure that you can automate that so you can free up that person to focus on something uh, more important, like innovating. Um, so Pulsar has fantastic APIs. Make sure that you tap into them. Um, those are gonna be key building blocks in your ability to build the automation uh, and integration and build a, a successful platform that will allow you um, to, to scale going forward. Um, and then also in terms of getting started, there's some you know, great managed service options available. Um, and then you've got Helm charts. Make sure that, I mean, unless you're, you need the latency of bare metal, Helm, the Helm charts will really make your lives easier on Kubernetes. Um, and if you're not at that scale yet, then you know, managed service is a good way to go. So make sure you, you're, you're utilizing the resources that are available. Um, and then Pulsar also has great integration with Grafana and Prometheus. Um, and you can build automation around those to make them more self-service. Uh, as you identify uh, common needs of your tenants, as more tenants are onboarded, um, it becomes easy to do that um, and focus on, on building the things that people are actually using or are going to be using. And then support plans. Um, most of you have cloud support available either through GCP, AWS, or Azure. Um, and if you have a managed uh, Pulsar provider, then make sure you're getting their help as well. Um, and previous company, we were using AWS, and um, I had to build this new flow, and 
uh, I, uh, it was all, you know, new territory for me. I literally created a support ticket for every piece of the flow I had to build. Um, and my boss said I got a year's worth of work done in two weeks. Well, the secret there is I was leveraging the expertise of others. And by standing on their shoulders, I, I was able to do a lot more with a lot less. So as you're building these successes, as you're, as you're accomplishing things, you want to build the success stories and share them. Testimonies inside your organization are a thousand times more valuable than from those outside the company. And the flip side is also true. If you have a loud spoken adversary inside your company, they can do a thousand times more damage than, any, than if that person was outside the company. So that's why getting the initial delivery right is so important. Um, you want to build that empirical validation um, and uh, by, by having those successes. So you're proving to the company what you can do. Um, and don't let it go unnoticed. Make sure you let your light shine. And then stay disciplined. Discipline is an, act, is an attribute of the most valuable uh, or the most profitable and successful companies. Um, so these are the companies that really focus on what matters most. So make sure you do that too. Okay, and then the last slide, um, recommended reading. So these are fantastic books. Um, again, hard copy or audiobook. Um, make sure that you're that you're constantly learning about how you can be successful um, in creating your micro startup, so that you can make sure your Pulsar implementation is successful. That you're really really utilizing it to solve uh, the right problems. Okay, questions. <laughs>